For some reason that we'll probably never fully understand, an extraordinary outpouring of energy began to occur around the year 1100. It was so powerful and so passionate that it transformed the way the world looked and thought about God, about justice and power, about women, love and art. This story starts with the almost unbelievable life of the woman we will come to know as Eleanor of Aquitaine. Eleanor had virtually everything this life can grant. Sunlit beauty, inherited power and wealth on a phenomenal scale. Kings as husbands, kings as sons. She lived an epic life in the middle of a whirlwind. Entangled with five mightily powerful men who fought for more than a century to control Western Europe. Surrounding them is an incredible array of people who lived in that world doing incredible things, from building stone cathedrals that streamed with sunlight, to fighting two crusades, to inventing fictional characters we still read about. We know of only a few of them, and what we do know of even these favoured few is limited by their records and our own comprehension. Come with us as we journey to meet Eleanor of Aquitaine, Henry Plantagenet, Richard Lionheart, King John, and all the remarkable people surrounding them. To be in their presence is an exhilarating experience. Won't you join us? Welcome to Lion's Forge. My name is Beckett, and I want to tell you a story, an epic story of five kings and the Lion Queen. Lion's Forge, Episode 1. We begin. The Scoundrel. More than anything else 950 years ago, land was wealth, and great lands meant great wealth. Lands could be won from others through war and through marriage, through luck, good and bad, and land could be defended through war and through marriage, through luck, good and bad. War and marriage, in turn, gave rise to armored knights on horseback, to deftly plotted betrothals and to sworn vows of fealty to lords more powerful than you were yourself. Subject to clever trades, subject to unexpected death, subject to desperate penitence, land was everything. Men could spend their entire lives fighting over land. Land made you rich. Being rich made you powerful. Being powerful brought you land. Baby boys who could grow up to smash their mailed fists into rivals' faces, and marry heiresses who brought yet more land, were absolutely indispensable. Every great lord and everyone around every great lord knew there had to be a baby boy. In the year 1071, just five years after that blood splash day at Hastings, an essential baby boy was born to one of the very greatest lords, the Duke of Aquitaine. Following unvarying family tradition going back nine generations, the baby was given the family name William, which meant the protector. He would become shocking, sensual, a good start to our story. A whirlwind of great families, crusades, rebellions, betrayals, heroes, saints, and monsters. The Norman conquest of England was only five years past. At the other end of the world, a Muslim army was about to defeat the Byzantine Empire. Irresistible forces were building. William IX survived every scourge the world threw at babies in those days. When he was 15, he probably helped carry his father's corpse to its torchlit tomb. It was now young William IX's turn as Duke of Aquitaine, hereditary ruler of huge, rich, ancient territories stretching from the River Loire to the north to the Pyrenees Mountains in the south. Aquitanian wine, salt, dyes, and grain, the staples of life, traded in his harbors for German silver and English wool. Poets and musicians, including infidel Muslims, were welcome at his table. Glittering titles hung from almost every branch of his family tree, including his kinsmen, the King of Aragon, the King of Castile, and the Holy Roman Emperor himself. The ruling duke, accordingly, was one of the greatest nobles living on the European continent. As for 12th century Aquitanians, they were described by a contemporary as full of life, elegant in their dress, 
handsome, witty, and hospitable. Their critics, of which there were many, were equally prepared to view the place as aggressive and bad-tempered, addicted to lust, extravagance, vanity, and general immorality. Aquitanians didn't care. They preferred to dwell happily upon their reputation for good looks, lovely manners, sense of humor, and general flair for life, so sadly lacking in other less fortunate parts of the world. However, their lord, William IX, despite his nobility, power, wealth, and hospitality, was viewed at the time as lazy, irreverent, reckless, and pulsing with lust. Undoubtedly arrogant as a god, William apparently just liked to raise hell. The young duke had little interest in the dry business of ducal administration, especially ducal administration in a country as notoriously and energetically opposed to being ruled as the Aquitaine. Neither a pious nor a serious man, he turned his considerable energies in a more genial direction, said to always be occupied by pleasure at a time when there were so many lordly pleasures with which to occupy himself. He had only rough control of his famously rebellious domain, a lifelong task that would have required the sober discipline he apparently lacked. There was incessant, often very violent, jostling among the proud lesser lords who lived in William's lands for control of territory nominally within the duke's possession. The Aquitaine's riches were a perpetual temptation to these men with dynastic ambitions of their own, and prior generations of Williams of Aquitaine had battled, not with complete success, to keep the rebels at bay. The most rebellious of the lot were at the dukedom's geographical center, near Limoges, near Angoulême, and in Lusian territory. The harassed duke probably didn't even catch the worst of it, since the barons readily went at each other hammer and tongs whenever the opportunity presented. In one excessively quarrelsome Aquitanian family, a young nobleman raped his aunt, after which his outraged uncle retaliated by having him castrated before he was summarily murdered. And R. William made his share of mistakes. He fought his in-laws to hold on to his wife's ancestral lands, he repeatedly enraged the church by cheating it out of tax revenue. He threatened to murder the bishop of Poitiers. He had to face the embarrassment of putting a mortgage on his wife's inheritance to raise the cash to pay for his embarrassing attempt at crusading, itself probably forced on him by his confessor as penitence for his many, many sins. He had to be helped to limp home from the remnants of his army, unlikely to please a wife whose lands had been bartered away to finance the debacle. His battles with the church branded him a notorious excommunicant more than once. We need to stop here for a minute to talk about what it means to be excommunicated, something that will happen to many of our characters rather startlingly often. Excommunication was punishment for a very grave sin. It cut you adrift from the Catholic Church, the only source of spiritual support for Europeans at the time. Not only did excommunication damn your soul to eternal hellfire, it also made daily life even more difficult than it already was. Contracts with an excommunicant, for example, were considered to be tainted, and children of an excommunicant were considered illegitimate. Excommunication could be lifted if the sinner expressed genuine remorse stopped the sinful behavior, and performed penance, which could range from lashes on one's bare back, to saying extra prayers, to such extreme examples as going on crusade. When it came to ruling lords, excommunication of the sinner could, in truly extreme cases, be combined with interdict of one's lands, which also blocked the lord's unfortunate subjects from the church we'll see quite a few cases of real and threatened interdict as stubborn kings clash with equally determined popes. But it wasn't an equal contest. Interdict was so traumatic for the entire population that just the threat of it usually carried the day. Getting back to our excommunicated duke. William was a notorious scoundrel with women, boasting that he was so compelling a lover his bedmates would have happily paid him people were perfectly willing to credit gossip that young girls had been recruited by the duke to ride with his crusaders, 
or that he blasphemously funded a convent of beautiful prostitutes. His war shield reputedly featured the image of his longtime mistress, William telling his appreciative men that he wanted her with him on the battlefield as much as he wanted her in his bed. Naturally, like all men with titles and land to protect, he was married to 20-year-old Philippa of Toulouse, already a widow and a former queen, thanks to her first marriage to the King of Aragon. Heiress to lands that bordered the Aquitaine, the wealthy and well-born Philippa showed every promise of serving as a true consort to the rich, powerful duke. The lady was even a blooded warrior. She rode with William at the head of an army in 1098, fighting a male cousin to hold her inheritance in Toulouse, a place that would agitate the lives of William's heirs for decades to come. The duke and his duchess won the battle, and Philippa then ruled her ancestral territory in her own right. She appears to have been entirely capable of governing William's possessions when he left the Aquitaine to fight the Turks, and even had the steely presence of mind to ignore his sexual boastings and acting out. He came back to her bed often enough that she bore him at least five children, including two boys, his heir William X and a second son, Raymond, who would play a major role in the family's history again some twenty years later. One would think that the duke and his queenly duchess should have ruled, fought, made babies, and grown ever closer, a splendid alliance of two strong-willed, well-mated human tornadoes. Sadly, we're born to a world of trouble, and trouble eventually found them. One cause may have been William's decision to mortgage Philippa's battle-won inheritance in Toulouse back to her rival cousin to raise the cash to go crusading. Another reason seems to have been a famous traveling preacher named Robert de Arbrissel. If William the Ninth was at one end of the medieval spectrum, the brawling, lustful warrior, Robert was at the other, a man who actually lived the God-fevered, destitute life of a celibate hermit. Ice pick thin, as famous as a film star, Robert drew excited crowds who wanted to hear him hector them back to godliness from their abyss of sin. The Pope heard of him and, impressed, deputized him to travel Europe, setting to rights unholy priests, feuding nobles, and monastic concubines. People at every stop marveled at his eloquence. Hordes of followers reportedly including an entire brothel renounced the wickedly appealing world to join monasteries after hearing some truly riveting de Arbrissel sermons. Despite his rejection of the base things of this world, Robert was the abbot of an established monastery, which began to founder under the crowds arriving to take up the religious life after exposure to his call. Pressed on all sides to start his own abbey and deal with the attendant management problems himself, he founded the Abbey of Fontevrault in the year 1100 on land donated by Philippa's sinful husband. Set in the pleasant valley near the Loire, Fontevrault would play a significant role in the world of Europe's medieval noblewomen, including refugees from William's own tempestuous family. Within 50 years, more than 75 abbeys modeled on Fontevrault came into being, and thousands of men and women had joined his order. For a thousand years, the church that Robert revered and served had viewed women as the so-called weaker vessel, direct causes of the sins of lust, pride, gluttony, and greed, pitiful heiresses of the serpent who had handed that apple to Adam. Ecclesiastes warned, I find more bitter than death the woman who is a snare, whose heart is a trap, and whose hands are chains. Aristotle, revered by medieval thinkers, considered women entirely lacking in intelligence, no more focused or deliberate than the average squirrel. However, a few unusual individuals in Robert's day were beginning to wonder about new ideas. Perhaps the God who offered up his only son to save mankind saw love as a force as powerful as remorse for sin. Women, weak and sinful though they were, understood love. Perhaps women had a part to play in God's world. Even their scornful contemporaries granted that medieval women marked their world. 
It was true that they couldn't swear personal homage to an overlord and offer military service as men did, but they married and birthed kings and dukes, bishops and popes. They inherited and ruled territories, their own and their husbands. Their bodies could cement alliances and their shoulders could heft swords. Even the same Old Testament that placed the blame for mankind's troubles at Eve's feet told of the brave and clever Jewish queen Esther. Cleopatra was legendary, as was Boadicea, a tribal queen of first-century Britain who had the courage to launch a furious, if sadly ill-fated, rebellion against the invading Romans. A millennium later, England's ferocious Ethelfleda of Mercia drove off both Vikings and Welshmen, something a number of her male peers were unable to manage. One chronicler wrote, approvingly, that a Norman countess with the brawny name Hellwise rode as a knight among knights, every bit as brave as her male companions. Still, females were typically thought to be mere adjuncts to men, heavy charges on the family purse, weak in body and in mind, the cause of sin, obstacles on the road to heaven. Even the brilliant abbess Hildegard of Bingen rejected her sisters, telling one of the leaders of the Second Crusade that he had the misfortune to live in what she called an effeminate time, as weak as a woman. Granted, there were exceptions to be found, but the exceptions did not change the general sense of female inferiority. It was Robert de Arbrissel, revered, influential, connected to the best thinkers of his age, who made the startling decision to place a nun, not a monk, at the head of each of his abbeys. And in turn, Duchess Philippa, heiress and warrior, capable administrator, perhaps just a bit disenchanted by a life with one of the bawdiest great lords in Europe, found herself drawn to the chastely compelling d'Arbrussel while her husband was in far-off Syria, failing at his crusade. For his part, Duke William, accustomed to exerting his will on obedient underlings, found himself thoroughly routed in the Holy Land, his army torn to pieces, kinsmen's corpses picked apart by rooks before his exhausted eyes. In the wake of such humiliating defeat, he undoubtedly just wanted a quiet place to lick his wounds. Regrettably, for family peace, by the time William made his way home, he apparently found himself with a wife facing the loss of her inheritance, thanks to his need to raise cash for his pitiful effort at a crusade. A wife who perhaps simmered at the idea that she was not necessarily his inferior, a wife no longer complacently tolerant of his swaggering affairs. This power couple, long wedded, children and thrones between them, began to unravel. We don't know the specifics of William's parting ways with Philippa, only that William's wandering eye, always restless and now possibly motivated by cold shoulders at home, wandered anew. In 1115, when he was in his mid-forties, he became intoxicated by a married lady and mother of three, a countess who was the evidently very alluring wife of one of William's vassals. Although historians now argue that it's probably not true, legend maintains that she was compellingly nicknamed La Dangereuse, the Dangerous One. In time, William made the move that crowned his reputation for virile sin. He rode off on a fast horse with the Dangerous One, who doesn't seem to have been screaming for help. Philippa, duchess and legal wife, arrived home one sorry day to find the Dangerous One sleeping with the Duke. The tempestuous affair of William the Ninth and his lover, Dangereuse, known to everyone, of course, meant no priest would ever marry them. It's believed they never had children of their own, but being who they were, you can almost see the two of them determined to have descendants who somehow would join their blood. In time, they found a way. William's oldest son by the unhappy Philippa, who of course was also named William, was married we think not willingly, to the countess's twelve-year-old daughter by her abandoned husband. The girl's name was Eanor. This next couple, William X and his very young wife Eanor, eventually birthed the blood-grandchildren of William IX and the Dangerous One. One of them would be Eleanor of Aquitaine. 
William's lawful wife Philippa, a great heiress herself and former queen of Aragon, not to mention the mother of his heir, was not without resources of her own. In fairly short order, the papal legate to William's court, a bald monk we know only as Gerard, appeared to demand that the sinful countess be dispatched back to her lawful husband. William's response was in the manner of, like hell I will, as he reportedly told Gerard that he'd part with the lady as soon as ringlets again crowned Gerard's head. Humiliated Philippa departed for Fontevrault, the creation of her friend Robert de Arbrissel, where she would live only another two years before death took her. Given all of this, William the Ninth comes across as just a big, crude, impulsive sinner. Yet, almost incredibly, William was also a precursor of the Renaissance man, who supposedly would not appear on the world stage for another three or four centuries. He was a reckless, half-godless brawler, but he was also a musician, a reader and thinker, a man who appreciated learning and taught his two sons to love that rarity, books. And somehow, he also became an imaginative poet of love and loss. Historians think he may have been the original troubadour, as he seems to have been the first European to write poetry in the everyday spoken language of his country. We still have eleven of his poems, along with a bit of a song, valued enough generation after generation that they were carefully passed along for a thousand years. Until William, as far as we know, no one in Western Europe had written a song or a poem in the common speech of the time, using everyday language to muse on what a loved woman meant to a man or on the bittersweet realities of human existence. We aren't sure why William broke such new ground. What we can say is that whatever motivated him, he had a role in starting to pry apart a thousand years of European thinking. Most of his writing, like his life, tends toward barracks room boasting. However, some of his verse demonstrates genuine, unexpected sensitivity. I have given up all I have loved so much, chivalry and pride, and I accept it all, that God may keep me by him. Or he imagines a beautiful woman to whom a lovelorn warrior dedicates himself, even if winning her may be a fruitless quest. William tenderly compared such love to the hawthorn bough that on the living tree stands shaking all night beneath the freezing rain, till next day when the warm sun waking spreads through green leaves and boughs again. But a later stanza in the same poem is unmistakable. She in good grace was moved to give her ring to me with true love's oaths. God grant me only that I live to get my hands beneath her clothes. Well, our William was irrepressible, so little wonder, perhaps, that he wrote so freshly, making everyday speech as fit for poetry as for bargaining for apples at the market. Anyone hearing it would know what it meant, and could recite it at the tavern, in the field, in bed to his wife. You wonder at him again, his scandalous life of war and lust, while he could also summon up a sense of mankind that was entirely different from the world he lived in every day. He was three-dimensional, a truly remarkable individual. R. William died at the age of 55, leaving behind two sons and a baby granddaughter. It was the year 1126. Philippa was dead. The dangerous one was dead. Robert de Arbrissel was dead. But his granddaughter had been born to the House of Aquitaine. Her name would come to be Eleanor. She was the descendant of wealth, power, reckless courage, impetuous lust, scandal, pain, intelligence, and remarkable creativity. During her 80 years on the earth, she was to be a ruler who married two kings and gave birth to two more, an adventurous prisoner and seductress, a lion of her time. Her century, the 12th, as we will see, was very much alive come to the end of our story for the time being. I am Beckett Arnold, narrating from the book Lion's Forge by Karen Markle Knapp, 
soon to be available at Amazon Books. Don't forget, if you like what you hear, please give us a thumbs up, save us as a favorite, and share us with your friends. Most importantly, please join us again in two weeks for the next episode of Lion's Forge, available everywhere you get your favorite podcasts.